What's going on? How's everybody doing? Good to see you. Love to hear all the chatting, man. I think we've created meet and greet culture, y'all. We're saying hello to each other. I love it, I love it, and all the more. It's all to the end that we love one another and are welcoming church to anybody that would come through our doors as well. So I'm glad to see everybody chatting it up. A uh, couple announcements real quick before we get started. That survey I sent out a couple weeks ago, I'm going to send it out one more time. I'd like to get like between five to ten more responses, and then we'll have like 60, 75 percent of our adult population will have responded. So I'm going to send it out again on Wednesday. If you've already taken it, praise the Lord, uh, you can't take it more than once. Um, if you haven't hit up that survey, just hit it up when I send it out this week. Uh, it's real easy. I think it probably, it can't take longer than like two minutes. It was real short. Um, unless you have a lot of questions, comments, and concerns at the end, then there's a fill-in section that you don't have to answer, but you can. Please be kind. That's all I'll say. Uh, <laughs> um, after, uh, it's all good. It's all good. Fumble. I'm in football mode, you know. Like, um, uh, after church today, ladies, if you haven't heard, you hear now, uh, the ladies are going to be going to uh, send off our Dana to lunch immediately after church. So if you need details for that, uh, don't get up with me. I don't even know who to have you get up. Leela, is that fair? Can they get up with you? Okay, <laughs> get up with Leela. <laughs> I didn't, that, was, that was totally on the whim. I didn't warn her about that. I didn't warn her. Um, and the last thing, so some people talked. It was, I think, my wife and Thunga and um, Leela, I think we're talking after I think it was after church last week, and I thought they had a great idea, so we're going to do it. And uh, on October 9th, this is very informal, right? It's a pay-your-own-way. I tried to see if they could give us group rates and all this stuff. Because we're not a school on a field trip, because of all these things, there's no group rates for us. So it's a pay-your-own-way. We're just going to have a meetup up at uh, Gaver Farm and, uh, in Mount Airy. There's a pumpkin patch. It's fun. It's like... I think it's 18 bucks a person and there's and we can't we're not going to pay for the whole thing. Uh, but if you need like a scholarship, like if, you, if there's some reason that like you can't pay uh, right now or whatever, like please reach out to me. Don't let money stop you from going. Um, but uh, they wouldn't give us a group discount. They're like next year we got you. I was like that doesn't help me this year. So <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but so because we're not a school and we're not renting, there's no party sections available to rent. There's no discount for us. So sorry about that. But October 9th, 12, 12:30, we're just gonna drive over to Gaver Farm. It's G A V E R. And you can buy your tickets in advance if you want, or buy them at the at the door or at the. I don't think it's a door, but the gate maybe. But it's awesome time. Come out with your kids if it rains. We're not going to do it in the rain, okay? Not, we're not paying up front where we got to just muscle it out. We'll just postpone it till the next weekend, which I think is the 16th. But as of now, Gaver Farm on the 9th. There's cool things like an apple orchard. You can pick your own apples. That's an extra fee. There's a, you call that thing? Hayride, and it's like the best one I've ever been on. It drops you off at the pumpkins, and they're continuously coming, and they pick you up, and pumpkins are extra. Everything's an extra fee, just... Except, except the hayride. Except the hayride. I think the hayride's included. Was that? Yeah, that's it. That's it. So bring your money. That's what I'm saying. And the donuts, your kids will not be able to avoid the smell. Neither will you. I'm telling you. They got these donuts. They're to die for. My diet is on a break that day. So Gaber Farm, October 9th. I think it's gonna be great. Join us. Um, more details next week. Maybe we'll just like meet at the gate. We'll stand at the gate at like 12:30 to like 12:45 ish and get people together so all right hebrews chapter 11 told last week that there was a transition to kind of the next portion of the text the next section of the closing of the letter there's 13 chapters we'll have this week and two more weeks then we're going to move on and next week i'll tell you what we're what we're doing next to lead up to thanksgiving which is sounds crazy to say but it's true it's coming faster than we think and so Today we're going to be in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, extremely popular chapter. Most of you can probably quote the first few verses. It's the Hebrews Hall of Fame. A lot of different names for it. It talks about faith and it is a doozy. It's a long chapter. We're, going to, we're actually going to go through the whole thing, but the, the large middle section, I'm going to kind of more summarize and just kind of, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. It's a great chapter. Um, strap in. I hope that we Hope I'm able to do it justice. So, Lord, uh, I just pray that we would learn something today about faith, uh, about who you are in relation to our faith. How that you would tune our ears and our hearts to your will, to your mind, to your heart. 
Uh, bless our hearing today in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So let's just get to it. Let's read uh, verses one through six together. If you don't have your Bibles, they'll be on the board. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith. Faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That verse is so popular, but I also feel like at times it's a little obscure. What does it mean that faith is the assurance, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen? I think the most important aspect of figuring out that verse is what faith means. What does faith mean? Let's look at that definition of faith. Faith. There we go. Pistis. That which evokes trust and faith. And look at B, a state of believing on the basis of the reliability of the one trusted. Trust, confidence, and faith. Faith is having a, a confidence in someone or something based on it, its reliability. So when we say we have faith in God, there is a confidence and a trust in him that is not based on just irrational, throw caution to the wind belief, but rather the reliability of the one we say we believe in. So the reason that faith can be assurance and conviction is because we're banking on a trustworthy source. God is the ultimate trustworthy source. If there was ever a person to have trust, confidence, or faith in, it's the person of Jesus. It would be our God. There is nowhere, no place, no time where God is not faithful and trustworthy. So when you say you have faith in Jesus or you have faith in God, you are saying, I have a confidence in the reliability of his person. Why? Because of what he's done, because of who he is. So we begin to see in this how by faith these people of old did these things. We see talk of Cain. I'm sorry, Abel. Cain would be a terrible example of faith. <laughs> Just forget about that one. Abel, Abel had faith. He first starts out by saying, by, by faith we understand that God created the universe. We see that in Romans. It's like, that creation is evidence that there's a creator. But we believe that by faith. The reliability of the one, the trusting in the one who is reliable. By faith, Enoch was taken up. Man, that's one of the most incredible stories in the Bible. This brother Enoch is just walking, and then the scripture says, and he walked with God and was no more. What? <laughs> what? God just took him to be with himself. So when he shows up later with Moses to talk to Jesus... That brother Enoch never died. At least we know Moses died. Enoch just came back like, ah. <laughs> back to impart some knowledge to you, Jesus. Like, what? <laughs> Crazy. En but that was by faith, by his relationship and trusting in one who is reliable. Then it says that faith, man, you got to catch this though. This, how many of you long to please God, live to please God? I lived, I thought there'd be more hands on that one. I'm so sorry. I definitely did. <laughs> well, you know, live to plea. I don't know. No, uh, no, I get it. I get it. Now we're training and being an expressive church. Now we're talking to each other at the beginning. Now we're going to learn to be expressive. Y'all can shout and holler and hallelujah and raise your hands too. You know, I'll tell you. All right. 
and with this verse six, this is what we got to catch. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's our first carry out. Faith is essential to please God. So if you long to please God, if you live to please God, you cannot do it without faith. Without a deep trust and confidence in the reliability of God, based on the reliability of God. If we don't have a deep trust and belief and confidence in Christ as our Redeemer, in God as our Creator, we cannot please Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So for me, that begs the question, how do you build faith? How do you grow in faith so that you have a deep trust, a deep reliability in the master? Y'all might th start throwing the tomatoes at me, but here we go. Listen, I've said it before. I'll say it again. The answer is the same. It's relationship. It's, it's a deep relation. You build intimacy with the one who loves your soul, with the one who saved your soul. This husband-wife paradigm is not an accident. The scripture talks about it so much. You do not build intimacy with your husband or wife by never spending time with them. By never trying to learn who they are. You don't grow in relationship and trust with your children if you're not always trying to learn who they are. If you're not trying to teach them and build them up and raise them up. If you're neglecting them you know what your kids will begin to do? Distrust you. Because they don't believe in your reliability. If you're constantly dismissing your spouse, if you're constantly going to hang with the fellas instead of hang with the bride, at some point she will learn to distrust your reliability. Maybe not your faithfulness, but your reliability. See, if we find that we have a distrust with God, that we don't trust his reliability, that he's reliable all the time, that he's trustworthy all the time, that we can hang our hat, put all our eggs in that basket every time and nowhere else. What that says to us is not that there's something wrong with God. It's not even necessarily that there's something wrong with us, but there might be something wrong with our relationship with God. Because we haven't put in the necessary work to build a deep bond and trust in his reliability. And without that faith, without the faith that hangs my hat on the rack of Jesus every time without question and without fail, there's something wrong with my faith. And it's built through relationship, spending time with Jesus, loving Jesus through the reading of his word, the gathering of his people, through prayer and fasting. It just is. And we talk about this a lot. I feel like we mention this every couple weeks. But the truth is there's no substitute. Faith is built through deep and personal relationship with Jesus. There's no way around it. And what we're going to see next in verses 7 through 38, and I'm not going to read word for word all of it, is what it looked like for people to have that kind of deep trust and relationship with God. This writer goes on a tear of examples through the Old Testament of people who had a deep trust and relationship with God. He starts right off the bat in verse 7. I should say he continues. By faith, Noah being warned by God, by something yet unseen, he had, no one had ever seen what God was warning of. Some scholars even debate if there had ever been like a, a, a global like sort of rain like this. He's warned, but by faith, he builds an ark, condemning the rest of the world through it and becomes righteous by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed God when he was called to another place. That's verse eight, not knowing where he was going. Verse nine, verse nine by faith, he went to live in the land of promise, a foreign land. Living in tents. Verse 10, he was, it says he was looking forward to a city. His foundations and designer and builder was God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even though she was of old age, because she believed that he was faithful who had promised her. Verse 13, 
all of those people, let you think about this for a second, all of those people died in faith, not having received the things that were promised to them. All of them died, not having received what was promised to them. But they understood that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. They were looking for a better country, a heavenly home. That's where their eyes were stayed. Look at the rest of these stories of faith. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Listen to this. God had told him that through his son, the promise would come. Yet here he was offering him up as a sacrifice. And look what verse 18, uh, 19 says. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, speaking he did. His confidence in God because of God's reliability made it so that he was willing to sacrifice the promise, knowing that God would bring the promise forth because he's reliable, even if he had to raise his son back from the dead. That there was nothing, God is so reliable that nothing I could do out of obedience to him could ever shake his promise. Nothing, I, when God promises something, it happens. I don't care what it looks like on earth. And Abraham had his mind in that place, looking toward a heavenly home and a reliable God who he said, no matter how this turns out, God will do something even if he should raise him from the dead. By faith, Isaac Invoke future blessing on Jacob and Esau. Let me ask you something. I'm mean, going to tell you something. These next ones, Isaac, and then by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed his sons. Man, when we read those stories in Genesis about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the mistakes they made, can we talk about something that, that was good that was passed down from generation? We see Abraham, the man of faith, who believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then what does this scripture say about his sons? By faith. See, they may have picked up some bad habits from their daddy, but they sure picked up a good one. That they would believe God no matter what things look like around them. Think about your children when you hear that. What are your kids picking up from you? Are they picking up by faith, mommy and daddy did this? By faith, daddy went and did that? By faith, mommy went and did that? Some of your bad habits may rub off on them a little bit. You may already be seeing them. But I promise you, they're going to pick up on our faith. They will. Because faith is a habit to pick up also. By faith, this is verse 22, Joseph at the end of his life made mention of the Exodus and gave directions for his bones. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they considered the child beautiful and weren't afraid of the king. By faith, Moses, when he was grown, refused to call the son of Pharaoh, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh. He was the son of the most powerful man on the planet and refused to be called his son. And look what verse 25 says, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Oh, man, we don't like that one. You could be a son to the king or you could be a son to the king. Are these fleeting pleasures of sin good enough for you to settle? Because I promise you God's calling you to something higher than that. Greater than that. You make the choice, though. We make the choice every day. Are we the child of a king or child of the king? It's your choice to make. Look at verse 26. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the riches of Egypt. Wasn't a country on the planet, a nation in the world that had more than Egypt. They ran everything. But looking toward a kingdom that was to come, Moses said, those riches are far greater than anything he could give me. And I'll be the reproach of this land with my people rather than bow the knee to a man who thinks he's God. And before we go any further, do we have any semblance of that in our life? Do we bow the knee to anything and call it king when it should have no authority or power over our lives? Would we rather be associated as a reproach in this world or be associated with a king? All this was by faith. 
by trust in the reliability of a God he barely knew at that point. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood and the destroyer passed over. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea onto dry land, but the Egyptians, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish when she was disobedient, but gave a friendly welcome to Israel's spies. Then he listen to this, verse 32. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, whose faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in the deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Who's signing up for that? They were brutalized and mistreated because of their faith. Who wants to go in? Sawn in two. And to shut the mouth of a lion, you've got to stand face to face with one. Brings us to our second carry out. Faith does not ensure all goes well. Faith is essential to pleasing God, but it doesn't ensure all goes well. All these died having not received the promise. Man, that can be tough. Because we would like to think, right, that faith would ensure, like, I'm in Christ. I am in the will of God. All things are straight now. And while there is some truth to that, eternally, all things are straight. Forever. In this world, There'll be trouble. Different levels, for sure. Most of us, probably all of us, are not at risk of being sawn in two. I guess you could technically come face to face with a lion. I don't know where you're traveling. In Colombia, probably not. If you do, that's weird. That's like those stories in the scripture where like people are, the kids are out walking around and they do something bad and the bear just comes out of nowhere. Like, what? Where does that happen? What? So if a lion comes out at you in Colombia, I don't know, bro. You got to check your faith. I don't know. Something might be going on, man. That's, that's crazy. But that's a hard word, kind of, right? Faith doesn't ensure all goes well. And this is why, this is why we got to read our scriptures. This is why we got to look to the world around us and see how our brothers and sisters in other places are persecuted. And we have little elements of persecution here. You may lose a job for your beliefs. You may get sued for your beliefs and things like that. But for the most part, you're safe. It's not like that everywhere. It's why things like the word of faith theology is so dangerous. Right? Because it's like if all this bad stuff is happening, it's just your faith, homie. You've got to increase your faith. You've just got to believe God more. Oh, you're sick? You don't have enough faith. You don't have enough money? You don't have enough faith. That's not true. A lot of the people that were just named, the stories that were just told in here, these people were poor and destitute, didn't have food sometimes. They got stoned. You know what it's like to be stoned? Thrown in prisons with animals, infernos, burning fires. Would we dare say that the people in this chapter didn't have enough faith? Man, they they may have more faith than any of us. And in the midst of all of that, they never, never, I want you to hear this, they never saw the promise. So how 
How did they remain faithful? How did they still trust God when they had never seen the promise? All the things that were promised to God's people, the things that we now enjoy. Now that Christ has come and finished the work, they never saw that promise. How did they stay faithful? Because it didn't rely on what their eyes could see. It relied on the reliability of the one who made the promise. That's what we have to get, man. If we're relying on our own ability to believe God off some sort of misconception of what that means, if we're trying to press in to something based on our own ability to just keep persevering. See, when we press into God and get to know him, we begin to know his character. We begin to know him on a deeper level. And it becomes based on his reliability, not my ability. Whether they saw the promise or not, they had seen enough of God. So it talked about the Red Sea. Israel crossed into the Red Sea. How did they have enough faith to even go up to that sea and cross through it? Well, they'd seen God do some things back in Egypt. They'd seen him strike plagues and gnats and frogs and turn the Nile to blood. They were like, you know what? This God is reliable. He actually got us out of there. 400 years of slavery and he was, they were out. So when they walk up to the Red Sea, they have enough faith to believe that Red Sea, something, something's going to, maybe they wouldn't have conceived in their mind that the whole thing would just split and they'd walk right through. They knew something was going to happen though, because they'd just seen him kill all the firstborn and all of the most powerful nation in the world and pass over theirs. They knew he was reliable. And if he said, go that direction, they went that direction. So while faith doesn't ensure that all goes well, one application we have to take with us, though, is that he was with them the whole way. And no matter what happens in our lives, no matter how hard, no matter how strenuous, if God is with us, there's no better place to be. There's no better place to be. And do we believe that? Let's read these last two verses. All these, though commended with the faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Our last carryout for today is faith is perfected in Jesus. Faith is perfected in Jesus. The faithful God was faithful to his promises. And their faith, their having faith through thick and thin, no matter what was going on in their lives, wouldn't be justified until many, many years later. But when we see Jesus come, when we see the, the promise, the, the serpent crusher from Genesis 3, the one who's the promise of Abraham's seed, when we see the, the promised redeemer and deliverer of God's people, the one who would save the nations, not just Israel, but all the people of the world, when we see Jesus step on the scene, we see the fulfillment of every promise God ever made. We see their faith justified by it being perfected in us. Christ has come. And when Jesus did what he did, living that perfect life, sinless, blameless, dying on our behalf for my sin and your sin, raising from the dead and going to be with the, at the right hand of God, we saw their faith as well as ours being perfected. Everything they ever hoped for, everything they ever dreamed for was fulfilled in the purpose of Jesus. So as we see that faith is essential to pleasing God, doesn't ensure everything goes well, but is perfected in Jesus. Is that enough for us? 
that if the earth shakes and falls around us, if the waves are just overwhelming, do we believe that in the person of Jesus, my trust in God is perfected? His reliability is shown as perfect? There's not a greater act or demonstration in all the universe that could have shown God more reliable than what he did in the person of Jesus. It was the ultimate act of submission and obedience, the ultimate act of love, the ultimate display of his reliability, and the ultimate justification for why we can trust him with our whole heart, our whole lives, no matter how the nations rage. God is trustworthy. Jesus is reliable. No matter where he takes us to the ends of the earth, no matter what new home he takes us to, Christ is faithful. He can be trusted. He's reliable. And everything in us that needs perfection, as far as belief goes, is found in him. They having fun over there. <laughs> That's a, we need to start doing some of that. <laughs> Yay! Our kids are having fun over there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Talk about the faith of the next generation. Man, that they would see God as just glorious and beautiful and to be celebrated. Let's go to our next steps. A QR code will take you to our Connect card. And fill out our next steps or anything else that you need. Prayer requests, serving opportunities, giving can be done through there. First next step, just a reflection. Are you living by faith? You know, when you look at your life, just an honest examination and reflection. When you look at your life, can you say, like, man, in every area here, I'm trusting the reliability of God. I'm trusting the reliability of Jesus. I'm putting all my eggs in that basket. Do I live a life of faith? Could you, could you find me if they made another Hebrews Hall of Fame? Could you find yourself as by faith, Maya went? By faith, Dana went. By faith, Jarrell led his family too. By faith. Are we just crazy enough to believe God at his word? Next step two, B. <laughs> Those are letters. Good thing the kids aren't in here anymore. Spend intentional time praying for more faith. You know, there's stories in the scripture where disciples are like, ah, oh, Increase our faith, Lord. Increase our trust in you. Increase our belief in you and your reliability. Scriptures where the, I think it's the centurion says, I believe. He's, Jesus says he's going to heal his servant or his son. And he says, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right? Help. I believe you can do it, but help the places that I just not sure. I got a little bit of... Uh, Maybe, maybe not. Spend intentional time praying for that. Ask Jesus to increase your faith. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you trust God more. Next step, C. Read Hebrews 12 for next week. All right. I'm going to pray out and then stay in your seats for a minute. But let's pray out of the sermon and we'll go on to what's next. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for faith. Thank you that you're the author and perfecter of our faith and that our faith is perfected in you. I pray that we would grab hold of your reliability today. And as we go from here, that we would learn to trust you more, that we would spend time getting to know you better, that we would spend time in prayer asking for an increase in trust. Pray that we would see you as totally dependable. Thank you for faith. I pray that our faith would please you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.